With the mold remediation and paint prep work done, I could finally move on to painting the plywood walls. I started by masking off the floors around the shop, and first I vacuumed where I'd be taping the masking material down, otherwise the tape wouldn't have stuck due to all the dust. I used my 3M hand masker to put down the paper masking, and I'm not sure why it took me so long to finally get one of these things. It makes the masking process go so much more quickly, and it's really easy to get the masking applied accurately. After using the hand masker, I came back and added another row of builder's paper to give a little more protection against overspray. The last thing to mask off was the mini split units, and this was really where the hand masker shined, and I waited to mask these off until last so I could have AC while I worked. With everything masked off, I could get my paint sprayer set up, and I used a Graco Magnum X7 airless sprayer here. And I started with a coat of primer and got the sprayer set up with my primer for this project, Valspar PVA Primer. And this stuff is insanely cheap, around 60 bucks for five gallons, and I was pretty impressed by the coverage. After getting the sprayer and gun loaded, I dialed in the spray pattern on a piece of cardboard, and I was using a 515 spray tip here. With everything looking good, I got my scaffolding moved into place, put on my respirator, and got to spraying. And when spraying, I tried to keep my gun perpendicular to the wall and overlapped each pass about 50%. And this 515 tip has a 10 inch wide spray pattern and I was able to get good coverage fairly quickly. I probably could have gone with a 517 tip here to get a little more coverage more quickly, but the 515 tip worked fine. I continued on down the right wall of the shop, making sure it hit all of the walls and trim with a good coat of primer. And as you can see, things were looking really good. I burned through the first five gallon bucket of primer once I got into the CNC room and switched over to some Kills 2 primer, which I had left over and wanted to use up. And one accessory I'd highly recommend when spraying is this little sprayer saver bucket stand. This genius little device tilts your bucket of paint to make sure your sprayer can suck up every last drop, and it's so nice not having to fight your sprayer running out of paint. I continued spraying, finishing up the CNC room, and then I moved out to the work platform area to finish up the first coat. I switched over to another bucket once I drained the kills, using up some more primer that was left behind by the previous owner, and in total I sprayed about 10 gallons of primer for this first coat. And just for reference, this first coat took about 2 hours to spray and I got it sprayed by lunchtime. In between coats, I dropped the spray gun into a bucket of clean water to keep the paint from crusting over, and I took a nice long lunch to give the paint a few hours to dry. I switched over to my paint for the second coat using another fairly inexpensive paint, this Valspar 2000 in Repose Gray, one of my go-to colors for neutral walls. And this was mostly just more of the same, although I changed my spray pattern going up and down rather than side to side, and this was just to make sure I was getting good even coverage. This second coat didn't take nearly as much paint since the plywood was pretty well sealed at that point, and I used one five gallon bucket of paint on this coat. I also got this cool GoPro time lapse of this entire coat of paint, and I thought this was a pretty cool angle with the GoPro on the back corner of my scaffolding. As you can see, I would spray the top row covering roughly 20 to 30 feet at a time, then I'd hop down and spray the bottom row overlapping between the two rows. And this up and down spray pattern was a lot more taxing on my back, and I definitely felt it once I was done with this second coat. I wrapped up the second coat painting the cabinet that was already here, and this thing is really well built and in pretty great shape, so I figured I'd keep it and just give it a little facelift. And with that, the second coat was done, and the walls were looking great. Well, I guess now we know what, uh, what I'm gonna look like in about 10 years once more my gray hair comes in. That's pretty weird. <laughs> But glad I was wearing a respirator because otherwise this stuff would have been in my lungs. So always wear your respirator when spraying, especially a big room like this. After letting the paint dry overnight, I came back to some fairly rough walls. And this was because the water-based primer and paint I used raised the grain on the plywood, which is something I knew was going to happen. And this particular sprayer can't spray solvent-based finishes. And I could have rolled on a shellac or oil-based primer to avoid this, but I felt like spraying the primer sped things up enough to where I was okay with sanding back the raised grain. To do the sanding, I used my DeWalt drywall sander. I did have to change my sanding pads fairly often as this latex paint tended to gum things up but I was able to sand all of these walls in less than an hour. 
Once the walls were sanded, I got set up for the third and final coat, spraying more of the Valspar 2000 paint. And just like the second coat, I went through pretty much the entire five gallon bucket with just a tiny bit of paint left over. With all the painting done, all that was left to do was clean up the sprayer, which was pretty simple. I sprayed the paint left in the spray lines back into the paint bucket and then ran water through the sprayer to clean the pump and the lines. I changed my bucket of water for some clean water and repeated the process. And with that, the gun was good to go. I left the paint to dry over the weekend and could start getting things cleaned up the following week by removing all of the masking material. Unfortunately, even with all this masking, I still managed to get some overspray on the floor, but thankfully it's not a huge deal since this shop floor has seen better days anyway. With that cleaned up, I wanted to finally start getting a few things organized now that the walls were painted. First on the list was my lumber rack, and I started by ripping some 2x4s down into 2x2s to use as mounting guides for the brackets. I set up a laser line for my first row about two feet off the floor and nailed the 2x2s in place in line with the laser. And I wanted to be able to store 16 foot long boards, so I needed to piece together each row with two lengths of 2x2. Two two. I'm using the same fast cap metal brackets I used in my last shop, and you can see how the bracket is designed to work with a 2x2 two two to make wall mounting go super quick. Next, I moved my line laser up about 18 inches for my next row and continued mounting more 2x2s. Two two. From there, I just continued up the wall, stopping about two feet below the ceiling joists. With the two by twos in place, I could start mounting the brackets and I spaced the brackets 32 inches apart or every other stud, except for the very last column of brackets, which needed to be 16 inches apart to support 16 foot boards. The brackets install with three screws each and are incredibly strong once mounted. As you can see, I can easily hang from the brackets so they should have no trouble holding my lumber. With the brackets mounted, I could finally get the rack loaded up, and it was so nice to be able to get the leftover framing lumber we brought from the old shop up off the floor. And as you can see, I've got 10 foot, 12 foot, and 16 foot boards on here, and they're all nicely supported. The next storage system to get set up was my brand new pallet rack from Global Industrial. And my plan is to stock up on plywood, hopefully when the prices go down some, and have quarter inch, half inch, and three quarter inch plywood ready to go so I can quickly load the sheets right onto the CNC. I had a fairly close call with one of the uprights falling right behind me, and thankfully I walked away from this unscathed, as this could have been a lot worse. I was having some trouble getting the rack assembled and after trying for way longer than I'd like to admit, I finally realized that I hadn't accounted for the steel I-beam when laying out the space for the rack and the rack and I-beam were interfering. Thankfully the fix was simple and I could just cut a few inches off of the top of one of the uprights. My angle grinder made pretty quick work of this and I had the uprights cut down in a few minutes. I ran into another issue when trying to reassemble the rack and it turned out the measurement between the beam and floor at the wall versus further from the wall was quite a bit different due to the <laughs> janky slab. So I had to cut a little more off of one end of the uprights. Thankfully this fixed it and the pallet rack slid right into place and fit like a glove. I added the second shelf about 30 inches above the first and this should be low enough to still easily pull plywood off of the top shelf. Next, I wanted to move some pallets under the first shelf, but first I needed to shuffle things out of the way. I figured I could go ahead and move some of my workbenches into place on the work platform, starting with my Joburg's workbench. And this thing is insanely heavy, but thankfully these Rockler workbench casters make it really easy to move around. Next up was my assembly table, which might be even heavier than my workbench. And for some reason, I tried to use these little dollies to move the table rather than just moving the rockler casters over. And this obviously did not work as expected. I finally wised up and attached the casters and as expected, this made moving the assembly table much easier. I also managed to lower the table directly onto my toe when dropping the casters down, so that was fun. Anyway, with those out of the way, I could use my Global Industrial Electric Pallet Jack to move the pallets of concrete and lumber under the pallet rack, and man, was it satisfying to tuck these out of the way so easily. The last thing to do to get the pallet rack ready for plywood storage was to cut some cross support pieces to span the gap between the shelf supports. 
and I just used some scrap 2x4s here, cutting them to fit. And these won't really be supporting much weight, they'll really just keep the plywood from sagging in the middle. Next on the shop storage list was setting up my plywood offcut rack, and I did an entire video on the build process of this rack in case you're interested. I started by shimming the rack to get it leveled and then screwed it to the wall, making sure to drive the screws into studs. I used an oscillating multi-tool to trim off the excess shims, and I should mention that I cut these shims out of treated lumber. With that done, I could get the rack loaded down with all of the various plywood odds and ends that have been cluttering up the spray room since I moved out of my old shop. I also went ahead and labeled the edges of the larger sheets to indicate whether they were full sheets or ripped down pieces, since it's kind of hard to tell when looking at the edges. Last but certainly not least on the list was getting my French cleat wall hung up. And I've been using this French cleat wall for years now and love not only its storage utility, but also how it looks as a filming background. I also have an entire video on making these French cleat panels and tool holders if you're interested in seeing how these were built. I started by hanging the leftmost panel, screwing it to the wall with two and a half inch screws, making sure to hit the studs where possible. I repeated the process for the next two panels, probably going a little overboard with the screws, and then I also hit the panels with a random orbit sander to remove any of the staining from the mold that had built up on the panels previously. And the mold was already killed, which I covered in the last video, and I vacuumed the bulk mold off of the surface of the panels before sanding. The last thing I wanted to do prior to hanging my tools on the wall was to knock down the sharp edges on the cleats, since it's really easy to catch a knuckle on these when grabbing a tool. I used a block plane for this and was also able to smooth out some of the areas where the rows didn't quite line up between the panels. Once that was done, I could start getting things hung back on the wall, starting with my drill charging station. And this charging station was made by Andy Glass, and I absolutely love it. I also realized just how filthy the thing had become with tons of black overspray dust from when I painted the tiny house kitchen cabinets back at the old shop. Thankfully, a quick sanding took care of this, and now I'll finally have a home for my drills and impact drivers in this new shop. Next, it was time to go through the box of tool holders I had built, and these were also pretty dang filthy. I gave them each a quick vacuum as I unpacked them and then got them mounted on the wall, using a screenshot from a video at my old shop as a cheat sheet to help me put everything back the way it was. I also went ahead and added one more French cleat to the left of the panels to hang some of my longer clamps and my most used ladder. And with that, the French cleat wall was done for the time being. All right, guys, with the French cleat wall up, it is really starting to feel like my own shop in here. It's super exciting to have some of these storage projects checked off. There has been stuff just scattered everywhere in this shop since I had to move out of my old shop, so that was a big relief. So next up, since the weather is beautiful right now here in Asheville, I figured I'd go ahead and knock out some of the outdoor projects that are on the to-do list, including the grating on the right side and the back of the shop, as well as building that front porch that I talked about in last week's video. So if you guys don't wanna miss those videos, go ahead and get subscribed and ring the notification bell. Also, as always, I'll have links to all the tools and materials I use down in the video description below. And last, if you wanna support me, I sell merch. I have plans available for a lot of my woodworking projects and and I have both Patreon and YouTube members set up. All right, thanks for watching y'all and until next week, happy building.